Spirit be with you all. Thank you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. of interconnections between our church and those around us who don't know you as you are. We pray that by the power of your spirit you would reveal the ways you are working in our friends and families, in our co-workers and colleagues. Use us, Jesus, to represent the truth of who you are to an unbelieving world. Let us earn the right to be heard. And when we've earned that right, may we share words of life, words of relevance, words of truth, words of beauty, words of grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated for our lectures this morning. God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet and consecrates him in the womb. Jeremiah's task is to preach God's word amid the difficult political realities of his time, before the Babylonian exile. He is to make God known not only to Judah, but also to the nations. 
The first lesson is a reading from Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Here ends the reading. We will read this psalm responsively. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb you have been my strength. My praise shall be always of you. Christians in Corinth prided themselves on their spiritual gifts. Paul reminds them that God gives us many gifts through the Holy Spirit, but the purpose behind all of them is love, the kind of love that God showed us in Jesus Christ. The second lesson is from the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to the childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Here ends the reading. thanks to both of you. It's always nice to hear the, the tone of the voices of younger adults sometimes. It, it's very appreciative. Thank you both very much for reading this morning. The Holy Gospel this morning is a follow-up from the one that we had last Sunday, and it is according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue, in Nazareth, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He was speaking.
speaking of Isaiah that he read from, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Dr. Cure yourself. And you will say, do you hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum? And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Please be seated. Why do we sometimes worry ourselves silly over something so trivial when it gets lost. Why does that bother us? It's always in the last place that you left it, right? <laughs> but why do we worry so much over that which is lost? I see that idea coming up in this book of Luke that we will be reading from in the Sundays of Head. The book contains stories about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. The lost are all over the pages of the Bible, not just in this one book. There are the lepers who were lost. There was that widow at Zarephath that was lost. So many people in scriptures, when you come to think of them and about them, were lost. My question is, what are we supposed to do as believers about these people we know who are lost in life. <clears throat> What's our responsibility? <coughs> Excuse me. What are we supposed to do? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have given us <coughs> the responsibility as believers to be concerned about those we know who are lost. They are meant to be sheep of your fold, not creatures that wander aimlessly through life. And we have a distinct responsibility to these people. Help us, Lord, to respond to them with our talents in the times and ways that we can. In your name, amen. <clears throat> I read the other day where lots of apple growers in 
our country are worried about the future of apples. That didn't quite hit me as one of my main concerns in life. But for many of us that don't mo know much about apples, we get apples and oranges confused all the time in our lives. The problem as an apple grower doesn't seem very significant to any of us. So what are they whining about now? The price of apples? No. That's not their concern. Here's the problem. Once in America, there were over, get this, 17,000 varieties of apples. Now that would take some of your time in the grocery, wouldn't it? Picking them out. These were all grown in the United States. Today that number is down to 5,000. It seems like a lot. But to them, the grower, it's quite a significant loss in terms of variety. Apples are dying out. You'll be lucky in the days ahead, they say, that you can find uh, even one bad apple anywhere if this continues and they list a range of causes. But the bottom line is, they are right. The Excelsior, the streaked Pippin, if that was your favorite, the Seri, and the Nero, once very, very popular apples for consumers, our history. The rest are a lost breed, never to be seen again. That fact is what worries me, never to be seen again. What does that really matter to any of us? We're not big apple growers. Well, to us, what it boils down is the problem of sustainability in our country, not only in our government, but in our churches as well. Sustainability is a growing, or should I say, not growing problem with us all. That should be a great concern to us as believers or apple growers because we just can't afford much longer to lose anything or anyone from our communities or from our trees or from our fields or from our workplaces. And I'm certainly not the only one that realizes this fact. It is very obvious to you. It's probably popped up in your conversations in the car or in the home. The sustainability of what we always have relied upon as being there because it gave value and when it's gone, it's not so easily replaced. Now let me revert back to Jesus because this was of great concern to him too, losing and the lost. He focused a lot of his spiritual and godly talent in speaking to people whom he knew from the get-go were lost. And he was very aware, in a very mystical way, of the importance of 
what seems so insignificant to other people that some people were getting lost. Some people didn't care. The numbers were still up. But to Jesus, every person, every apple in the bushel basket, so to speak, is of great value. Of great value. But today, that type of thinking, that type of philosophy like he had, is very, very questionable. Only the people who matter are the important ones. We need to see those who are the more regular. We need to see the people who actually have their feet on the ground and not their head in the sky and clouds all the time. For Jesus, every type of apple, so to speak, is worth preserving. He saw in these people what other people did not. But that dog won't hunt in our society today. That philosophy won't fly. Just like it didn't in his day either, when he was so concerned about reaching people and other than just brown-nosing those whom he was known to and was growing up next to, his preaching went over with people who understood what he was saying like gangbusters. Oh, here is a man who is really concerned with me as a person. Here is a person who sees me in a way that nobody else does. If you have watched that video of The Chosen, you'll know that look that Jesus communicated his care for people with by just looking. They could tell he was interested in them. But as we heard this morning, with those that saw him as someone different, saw him the way he was, only wanted to see him as he was as a kid back in Nazareth growing up. Back there, Jesus was a flop. The Bible even said that they took him out to the brow of a precipitous, a dangerous cliff, and we're going to push him over. They didn't see the real Jesus as you and I see Jesus today. Sometimes it is for us that only if we receive a person's admiration or compliment or if that person sees things the way that you and, and I do, well, we accept them. We don't ostracize, we don't abandon, we don't pull back our friendship as long as they see things like us. But there's a lot of people who can't see things that way, like us, and many of those people tend to be lost. It's not so much what people think about our ideals and our morals and our religions and our practices on Sunday morning that matters to so many who are wavering and wandering and back and forth in terms of hot and cold in their relation, if any, to Jesus Christ. What matters is that we see these people as a person, as one who has been created and given a soul, a body, and feelings by God himself. That, in my way of understanding, is how you and I are to see people like Jesus did. Everyone was valuable. He doubled down on that way of looking at people a lot, if you notice in Scripture. 
And even though it, the scripture says no prophet is ever accepted in his own town where he grew up, I know that for a well-known fact, and he was right. Because there was a time that I so wanted to be interviewed at my home church when it was vacant, but then it hit me. After those people knowing and remembering me as a kid in that church, as the one who sat in the balcony on Sundays and made paper airplanes, remembering that about me, they would never accept me. Jesus always focused upon those whom he could call, who saw him for who he had grown to be, God's son. He was a completely different person than those in his hometown remembered him as being. And for some uncanny reason, the people that Jesus reached out to in his ministry, admiring a person who was generally concerned for the real underdog of life, that was Jesus. That was written all over him. He was all about, in his ministry, caring for the kid who didn't have very much going for them in life. He knew the kid that came from the dysfunctional family whom he felt he had to reach. He had the kids that grew up around him that didn't get that brand new Mustang on their 16th birthday and were never a part of the group of the kids that did. He was one that stood side by side by the ones who had to struggle for everything that they got in their life and work for it when others never had to raise a finger and got everything. He was with those people, I assume, that had problem even in their day with drinking and gambling and chronic illnesses that just would never let go of them. Those are the types of people that so many of us, we want to forget in our life and keep it at least an arm's length, but not Jesus. He was always caring for those that everybody else thought was lost and never worth finding or caring for. Well, I think he was the one, I think he was the one that he saw that Matthew in the tax booth with just a look, and Matthew followed. He saw the boy who thought he could make it on his own in that fishing business of his day, but it was overrun by the big ships and the big catches, and the small guy never had a chance to make it in life. He saw that person and called him. He saw a person as hot-headed and as quick to put up his fists as was Simon. And he saw the Marys in life who constantly were worrying about what was going to happen to people. He's the one who came out to seek and to save the lost. And that's not very popular today, granted. But he wants to save all the apples in the bushel basket, not just a few. You and I today, as members of a church, that means a, commun a community that actively worships God in our services, you and I have to ask ourselves, who are those apples today? Apples that are getting tossed out of the basket, kicked aside, run over 
by the wheels of a tractor, those whom we say they're lost and not worth it. Who are they today that maybe we should be focusing upon? And sometimes you don't have to take too many steps too far to find these people. They are people even among us, believe it or not, who feel like they are beyond the reach of any of us to help them. Those are the people that need us perhaps the most. They are the people that goes from, go from one chronic illness to another that you and I, after a few Sundays, we kind of forget them. There's a host of these people that are out there and they need the contact, the communication. They need the feeling that they are not so far gone or so far lost as someone has forgotten to reach out to them. And I know that many of the times that we reach out, they are people who, who they feel that they are beyond the good graces of any church. But the widow of Zarephath is out there. The lost coin that has fallen through the cracks of life is out there today. There is that lost sheep who isn't accepted or repulsed by the doctrines of some church. They are out there. There is a lost son or daughter whose pride won't ever let them come back. They need to be reached out to. All of these types of people are out there, and some are in here. But let's remember what our Lord Jesus said about them, what he showed to be their value to him, and then let us pursue that same route of letting people know that we care about them, that we care about one another, so that none of us will ever have to fear or worry about being lost, at least not from us. Amen. We continue this morning with our hymn of the day.
you to please rise, if able, re recite the confession of our faith and the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Guide your church in the ways of faith, hope, and love. Cultivate ministries and communities of compassion that bear witness to your enduring presence among us. God of grace, teach us to live in humility on the earth, curb arrogance that leads to destruction of natural resources and disregard for future generations. Inspire the work of scientists who urge us to live in harmony with your creation, God of grace. You are the refuge of all who seek hope and freedom. Accompany immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who cross borders legally to find safety and opportunity in the right path. Embolden leaders to draft compassionate policies on behalf of these migrants and those whose lives assist and are put in danger for helping them. God of grace. As you say, love bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things. So comfort with your love all who are lost, lonely, fearful, brokenhearted, and sustain the hope of all those who suffer in any way, in body or spirit, especially in the prayers of our church this morning, do we lift our prayers for the family of Joe Gooding, who passed on the 22nd of this month in Florida for the family because he was the father of Paula Randall and the daughter-in-law of Karen Randall. As being a person of value and our responsibility for sustainability in the church and thankfulness for all those who are your creatures that you have placed here. God of grace, as your grace falls upon the young and the old alike, bless the gifts of children in this congregation and our young adults, such as those who read this morning, and give us humble hearts all to follow their leadership. Inspire us with their laughter and their insight and their curiosity. God of grace, and we praise you for those who have gone before us, as we have mentioned in our prayers this morning, Joe Gooding. And now of those who see you face to face, abide with us in this mortal life still until we rest in the arms of your never-ending love, God of grace. And since we have such great hope and all of these your promises, O God, in which we trust. We lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith, 
through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Please be seated, if you will. And I invite those who were newly elected to our church council at St. Peter to please come forward at this time, standing along the front of our altar rail. to see each and every one of you here this morning. To our congregation, these persons have been elected by the congregation to serve in positions of leadership as they have come forward today to acknowledge their desires. Our Lord says to each of us in Scripture, that in holy baptism our Lord Jesus Christ has liberated us all from sin and death and has made us each members of his church through word and through sacrament as you have been nurtured each in your faith. We confess the faith of our church just prior, the faith in which we are baptized and grow up and believe in our entire life. As St. Paul has written in one of his short short writings or epistles, that there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it is the same Lord who gives them. And there are different ways of serving the same Lord, different abilities and different forms of service. But the same Lord gives to each and every one of us the ability to perform in his presence. Hearing then the words of direction of St. Paul, the real father of the theology of our church, the one whose words we follow as true as being from the Lord himself, I then ask each of you, as you are here today to be installed, you are to see that the words and deeds of, of this household of faith Reflect him in whose name we each gather today. And we are to work with other members to see that the worship and that the work of Christ are are done in this congregation. And that includes the true word of God as well. And that God's will is also done in the community in, in which we live. And also we pray or the whole world. Each of you are responsible to be diligent in your your own specific area of serving that the one Lord who empowers all of us is the one Lord who is served. And as we are called to be examples of the faith, active in love, helping to maintain the life and the harmony of your congregation is a big responsibility, but you are all called due to your talents and to your heart's desire. If you accept your position upon the council and offices of this church, I ask you individually to answer by saying yes by the help of God. And people of God, the members of the congregation, I ask you, will you support these elected leaders? Will you share a ministry that is mutual with them, a ministry of the type that Christ has given to all of us as we have been called? If so, answer together by saying, yes, by the help of God. 
I now declare you then as installed officers, council members of this congregation of St. Peter. May God bless you in your service with his spirit that you may prove to be a faithful servant of Christ. And in his name we all pray. Amen. Let us pray. O Jesus Christ, as you have called many to be of service as they are able and according to the talents you have bestowed, we ask your blessing, we ask your resource, we ask your compassion, and we ask your confidence to be laid upon the shoulders and in the hearts of those who serve you by accepting this day as council representatives and as representatives of this Church of Christ, St. Peter. For it is in your name we pray. You are blessed then for your service in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As they return to their seats, uh, always interesting for someone like me that has not been among you very long to, in a certain way, be able to see the talents and abilities of many people. Uh, and it doesn't mean just because you sit silently or do not wish to be a member of a church council or any other. It doesn't mean that you are not an important giving part of this congregation. Like that sermon said this morning, <laughs> we're all just a bunch of apples. And as our Lord wants us to be, he wants us to be sustained as a group for years to come. Let us all work for that goal, which is a righteous one. Thank you. I ask you to rise as able. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always. And let us share God's peace with one another. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. There we go. There we go. Hey. <laughs> we continue this morning with our offertory. Merciful Father, we offer with joy, with thanksgiving, what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Signs of your gracious love, receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places 
offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. Sharing our life, he lived among us to reveal your glory and love for all people, that our darkness should give way to his own brilliant light. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray together the words that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, please be seated for just a few moments. Inviting you to prepare the wafer that is on the top part of your unit. Take your time, no rush. We partake of the body of Christ that has been broken for us. Thank you. Preparing ourselves with the juice. This is the blood of Christ that has been shed for us. May the body and blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. Amen. Pause just a few moments, allowing those units to be collected.
Thank you, Tom. Let us rise, if able, for the post-communion canticle. God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with peace and give you his favor. <laughs> Amen. We receive then the benediction of our Lord as we prepare ourselves with fervent love to reach out to the lost. The word incarnate leads us out and into the world that we may embody his life to our family, co-workers, friends, neighbors. Go in the power then of God's Spirit to love as Christ loves us and to serve the world he came to save. Amen. We join in the doxology of our service. see two hands, okay. I just, wanted, I just wanted to announce this week when you're at home thinking, what can I do? Bake some cookies because we are going to be wrapping cookies next week for um, our college kids to send out. Just wrap them individually. We'll wrap them or, or we'll send them out after our meeting, our welcome meeting that everyone invited to the ladies our salad luncheon right after church next week. And the third thing is we have back on the table um, in the upper room, there's some cards. If you have time after church, stop and sign them. They're for our homebound people for a Valentine's Day card, so we would love for you to do that too. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. There are donuts and coffee downstairs. And I don't know how Rosemary can bake cookies with Tom retired now. How is she going to get them to the church? See you in Cindy, it's nice to see you this morning. And you just think, my eyesight isn't that good, don't you, that I can't see you all the way in the back. But I can. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>